we'll start. EKGs are simple. 12 lead EKGs are real simple. The thing is, when you look at these, these books, they might talk for pages and pages how to read axis or pages and pages how to read bundle branch blocks. But forget all that foolishness. Just certain couple of rules. A couple of rules will tell you how to read any EKG. And when you look at the EKG, don't look at the whole thing at one time. And it gets scary. Just look at one lead at one time, or better yet, one wave of one lead at one time. And that way you can really evaluate it well. But if you look at the whole thing, it's a scary looking thing. Actually, EKGs are real simple. We even know, know a couple of rules. Now this, this lecture here, I used to give it to medical students when I was a resident at Big Charity in New Orleans. And so we just go in a treatment room and give this lecture and learn how to read EKGs in a half hour or so. It's real simple. So all you have to do is remember a couple of things. We're going to go over that right now. Axis. You know, axis is something you have to know about with EKGs. Not because it itself is important, but certain diseases have certain axis. You know, with a left bundle branch block, you get a left axis. And sometimes with pulmonary embolus, you get a right axis. So axis is sort of important to, to deal with. Axis is boring, too, but it's important. Axis. How do you do axis? Well, come on in. Hit. Axis. Well, this, this, is the, this is the leads right here. So here, here's the top of the heart. The two shoulders. That's lead one. That's standing lead one. And from the shoulder to the foot. Standing lead two. Foot to the shoulder. Standing lead three. So therefore, you can draw an, a triangle, Eindhoven triangle. And that'll give us axis. That'll let us evaluate axis. Of course, when we look at the V leads, we're looking at something different. We're looking one, two, three. We're looking at the front of the heart and the side of the heart. But axis is here, here, here. OK. So axis. Here's an Eindhoven triangle that we just drew. Now, you can break that Eindhoven triangle down into like a graft. You see lead one, let's put it right in the middle. Here's a, it's plus over here. Lead two, let's put it right here. It's plus down here. Lead three, shoulder of the foot, it's plus right here. So we can use this to plot the axis if we want to. If we want to get a real accurate axis. You don't want an accurate axis. You just want to know what the axis is. Right axis, left axis, normal axis. You don't care whether it's plus 25 or plus 30. Right axis, normal axis, right? OK. A normal axis is actually minus 30 to plus 110. So minus 30 to plus 110 is a normal axis. Now, if you, you know, if it's minus 10, you might say it's leftward. It's leftward. But it's still in a normal range. And if it's down here, plus 100 is it's rightward, but still normal range. But when it gets beyond plus 110, it's right axis. When it gets beyond minus 30, it's left axis. So left axis, normal axis. OK, how do we do that? You can take any of those leads, 1, 2, or 3, AVR, AVL, AVF, take two of them and plot it out, any two you want to plot out. Sometimes it's easy to use 1 and 3 because they're sort of distant from each other. Like, and you can give it any value you want. Let's say, let's give it a value of, uh, let's say, a sonometer. One, two, three. Let's say it's four sonometers. And let's give this one, let's take the R, the S in lead three and give it the same value. One, two, three, four. Four sonometers. Okay, let's plot it out. Let's give just, let's just make this all equal distance. All equally di equal distance. Not quite equal, but there you, go. there you go. Okay. Lead one is plus four. It's upward, plus four. Okay, this is plus in this direction. One, two, three, four. Okay, right there. Lead one, plus four. Lead three is minus. Downward, minus four. This is plus direction. This is minus. One, two, three, four. Minus four. How do you get the axis? You just drop perpendiculars to that, to that, and a perpendicular to this. And that gives you a certain point. And from the middle of that little graft, you stick an arrow out, and that's the axis. 
And you see when, when the R is the same magnitude as the S in 1 and 3, the axis is minus 30. It's left axis deviation. But that's too hard that way. Look what happens when you have left axis deviation. Your R in lead 2 equals the S in lead 2. Forget about plotting it out. Whenever your R equals your S in lead 2, it's minus 30. So it's, minus, it's left axis. Now, if your S if your S in lead 2 is, is bigger than your R, then you're really getting a lot of left axis, more left axis. Whereas if you had a normal height, height R here, it'd be a normal axis. And you can plot it out in the other way. How did you get right axis? Well, with right axis, you have a different configuration. In lead 1, you'll have a negative, a negative there. But therefore, this is it. Look at this. To get right axis, you have to have lead one over here. You see, you have to go negative. So this is how you can know whether you have right axis, normal axis, or left axis. Real simple. If they are, okay. If 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 in lead two, it's negative in lead two. It's left axis. If it's negative in lead one, it's right axis. That's it. Just that simple. If it's negative in lead two, it's left axis. Negative in lead one, right axis. Okay, say it's uh, positive in lead one. Well, that's not right axis. If it's positive in lead two, that's not le ne left axis. It's normal axis. Just, <laughs> right? Negative in lead one, left axis. Negative in lead Negative in lead one, right axis. Negative in lead two, left axis. And that, if it doesn't fit, it's normal axis. It's just that simple. So what, you don't have to plot it out like I just did. It's right here, just that simple. It always works out that way. So that's how you can just tell what your axis is. Left ventricle hypertrophy, right ventricle hypertrophy. You hear that all the time, right? Now, for right ventricular hypertrophy, it's real simple. When do you have RVH? For RVH, you just look at one lead. Don't look at all the leads. One lead, V1. Just a one little V1. And RVH is present when the R in lead 1 is bigger than the S. See, in lead 1, the S should be dominant. But anytime you have an R that's bigger than the S, you got RVH. Only one other thing that could be, it'd be a true posterior infarct. We're going to talk about that later. But our clock, our, our rotation, um, a clock, counterclockwise rotation. But in general, for R, VH, the R is greater than the S. If the R is not greater than the S in, in V1, it's not RVH. LVH. There's a lot of criteria for LVH. There's 16 different criteria. 16 different things you can measure out. One criteria is if AVF is greater than 13 and AVL is greater than 13, if standard lead 1 and, and, and standard lead 3 is greater than 26. But don't forget all that. That just makes you confused. This is the thing to look for. If you are, if the R wave in V5 or V6, you measure it out and then measure out the S wave in V1. Now if those two things, the R wave plus the S wave, positive R, negative S, if they're greater than 35 millimeters, greater than seven big blocks, it's LVH. That's it. R plus S, R in V5 or 6, S in V1, if it's greater than seven big blocks, it's LVH. Just that simple. Now how about left atrial hypertrophy, an enlarged left atrium? There's a lot of criteria you can use for that, diaphasic P and V1, but forget that too. Just measure the P wave. If the P wave is wider than two and a half tiny blocks, 0 0.1 seconds, then it's, out, then it's left atrial hypertrophy. 
So if it's bigger than two and a half blocks, left atrial hypertrophy. How about right atrial hypertrophy? Well, if it's taller than two and a half blocks, it's right atrial hypertrophy. So if you get all the other criteria, that's all you have to know right there. If it's wider than two and a half blocks, left atrial, taller, right atrial hypertrophy. That's the criteria that you should think about. Bundle branch block. And we're going to look at some EKGs and all of these things. Bundle branch block. Okay, bundle branch block, left and right bundle branch block, just, just, two, just two things. One, bundle branch block, the QRS has got to be bigger, wider than three tiny blocks. Wider than 0.12 seconds. So if the QRS, if you look at a QRS and you measure it, it's wider than 0.12, three tiny blocks, it's a bundle branch block. Now how can you tell whether it's left bundle or right bundle? Well, if it's, if it's taller in V1, upright in V1, like an M complex, V1, sort of the right side of the body over here, it's a right bundle branch block. If it's, sort of, if it's taller and upright in V6, sort of the left side of the body over here, it's a left bundle branch block. Just that simple. So 0.12 seconds, and look where it's positive. It's V1 positive, V6 positive. Positive V1, right, V6, left. So those are, those are the things that make you worry, these bundle branch blocks. But see how simple it is? Simple, axis, simple. It's real simple. Okay, infarct, myocardial infarctions. Okay, with a myocardial infarction, the first thing you get in the first, probably the first 30 minutes many times is a high peaked T wave, hyperacute T wave. Only other time you see high T waves like that might be with high potassium, hyperkalemia. But first 30 minutes, high peaked, hyperacute T waves, and then it becomes inverted. That's ischemia. That's the ischemia phase, first part of the heart attack. By the time they get here, it's usually different. By the time they get here, you usually see the injury, which is the ST segment elevation. And then the third phase of a of a myocardial infarction is the infarct phase, where you have the Q wave. Now you might, you might see all three of these things together. Or you might see them come in stages. You might get the Q wave right away. You might get the Q wave in a day or two. But this is the first things you see. Now, now how do you tell where your infarct is? You know, you, when you have the injury phase, how do you tell? When you have the Q waves, how do you tell? Well, you look and see, you look to see where, what leads are affected. Um, we're looking at the epicardial changes of the infarct. Now, for the inferior infarct, you can see two, three, and AVF, it's on the bottom of the heart. Therefore, if you get the ST segment elevation or the Q waves in two, three, AVF, it's an inferior infarct. And look here, the, the anterior infarct, V1, V2, V3, where is that? That's, that's right in the front of the heart. So therefore, if you get the ST segment elevation, the Q waves there, it's an anterior infarct. Okay, anterior lateral, V4, V5, and 6. 4, 5, 6, anterior lateral. So the changes are there, it's anterior lateral. <coughs> now, if you just get the change in AVL in 1, AVL in 1, it's, it's a lateral infarct. It's very lateral, you see? Way lateral. One type of infarct is a little bit harder to visualize. You know, see, this, this is the epicardial changes we're looking at. ST segment elevations. That's where the leads are. Now, suppose you get an infarct way in the back. The epicardium is now facing that way. So now the leads in the front you don't have any leads back there. If you had leads back there, you'd get ST segment elevations on your back. But the leads are in the front. So what do you get? You get the endocardial changes. Let's look at the endocardium now, the infarct. And what are those changes? Just the reverse of this. For the ischemia phase, instead of being inverted, it's upright T wave. For the injury phase, instead of being ST segment elevation, it's ST segment depression. And for the infarct stays, instead of a Q wave, there's no Q wave. It's just a, big, a bigger R wave. 
So therefore, the endocotagenes are just the opposite. So therefore, what does the true posterior look like? It looks like this in V1. V1, right? It's looking at the posterior from the wrong side. So therefore, you'll have T wave elevation instead of in inversion, ST depression instead of elevation, and no Q wave, just a bigger R wave. That's true posterior infarct. You see it in V1, V2. But V1 is where you look for that. So that tells you how to read all the infarcts, except the subendocardial infarcts. And all that means is that it's a diffuse infarct. It's a bad infarct. Diffuse. And all you get is ST segment depressions diffusely. All over the place, ST segment depressions, subendocardial infarct. You see, you're looking at the endocardium. On the other hand, if you have another diffuse process, pericarditis, you're going to look at the epicardial changes of this diffuse process. So it'll be ST segment elevations all over the place. You know, if you have an inferior infarct, you'll have ST segment elevations inferiorly. But if it's all over the place, it's, it's not an infarct, it's pericarditis. So for subendocardial infarct, ST segment depressions all over the place. For pericarditis, ST segment elevation all over the place. And the only other thing you have to watch out for is those T waves, the hyperacute T waves could be hyperkalemia. So you may, make sure you don't have hyperkalemia where they have these peaked T waves diffusely. And hypokalemia is just the opposite, inverted T waves or low T waves. For calcium, if you have too much calcium, calcium makes things contract, got a short QT. Too little calcium makes things relax, got a long QT. And magnesium and calcium act the same. So if you can remember those things, just these few things, you can read a 12-lead EKG. Read it easy. You can read it very easy. Better than most cardiologists. Remember that. Just remember <laughs> those few rules. One other thing. Yes? Yeah, with hypercalcemia, you get a short QT. With low calcium, prolonged QT. Calcium makes that muscle contract harder. Now, this looks complicated, but it's not. Hemiblocks. You've heard of hemiblocks, and you think it's too complicated even to bother with. Right? And in fact, I got a book on hemiblocks. It's a whole big old fat book on hemiblocks. And the whole big old fat book says just this right here. That's all it says right here. What are hemiblocks? Well, I'm going to show you some pictures a little bit later on showing the fascicles of the heart. You have three fascicles coming off the AV node. The left fascicle branches out. It's two fascicles. The left one branches out. So the left bundle goes into an anterior branch and a posterior branch. And the right bundle goes down to the Purkinje fibers and also. So three fascicles from the AV node to the Purkinje fibers. All you need is one of them to get the electricity down there quick. If all of them are blocked, if all of them are totally blocked, it's called complete heart block. But th many times they're not all totally blocked. Some are totally blocked, some are partially blocked. And that's what fascicular blocks are. What does it look like when it's totally blocked and partially blocked? Or you have a combination of them. Again, all you need is one fascicle to be fine, to get the, to get the, the impulses down quickly to the Purkinje system. If they're all blocked, it's complete heart block. <coughs> also, let me just say this. The skinniest fascicle is the right, the right bundle. That's a little skinny fascicle. That fatigues a lot. So therefore, if you've got atrial fibrillation beating real fast, that right bundle is going to get tired and go into block, functional block, and it's called aberrancy. So it gets tired of working. It gets it's too fast, coming too fast, let me rest. It goes into block. The impulse will go down the other fascicles, and you've got a right bundle branch block pattern, which is aberrancy. The fattest fascicle is the left posterior. You can hardly ever get a left posterior block. So it's got to be a big heart attack to produce that. So when you get a left posterior block from a heart attack, 
it's cardiogenic shock, you probably won't live because then you blocked all the fascicles off probably. You probably got complete heart block with an like anterior infarct and the death rate from that is 90%. But anyway, here, here's the, the blocks. Unifascicular, one fascicle is blocked. Bifascicular, two fascicles are blocked. Trifascicular, all three are blocked, but not totally. If they were totally blocked, it'd be complete heart block. Some are partial, okay? Left anterior hemi block. What does that look like? All that looks like is this. It's a left axis deviation. Therefore, it's negative in lead two. Left axis deviation, at least minus 60, and a little Q wave in one. That's left anterior hemi block. You see that pretty much. Left posterior hemi block is just the opposite. It's not a left axis, but it's a right axis deviation. A little Q wave in lead three. Q wave, Q wave in lead three, right axis deviation. Okay, that's the two fascicles from the left. And the third unifascicular block is the right bone branch block. That's the unifascicular block. Now, how do you get bifascicular blocks? There's only three bifascicular blocks. Well, well, you, well if, you get a, if you get a left bundle branch block, that's a bifascicular block because you've knocked off the two fascicles, left anterior, left posterior. So a left bundle branch block is a bifascicular block, actually. Or you can have a right bundle branch block with a right axis deviation. You see, right bundle branch blocks have a normal axis. That's what it's supposed to have, a normal axis. This has a normal axis, the unifascicular right bundle. But if you have a right bundle branch block and you have a right axis deviation, then it's really right bundle, left posterior. If you have a right bundle, it's a left axis, it's really right bundle, left anterior. So therefore, for bifascicular blocks, it's a right bundle branch block with some kind of axis deviation, either right or left, or left bundle branch block. So therefore, left anterior hemi plus right bundle branch block. Left posterior plus right, or left bundle branch block, three bifasciculus. How do you make it into trifasciculus? You just add first degree heart block to each one of those, and they each become trifascicular. So if you have a left bundle branch block and the PR is prolonged, you have a trifascicular block. That means it's prone to complete heart block. You see, that means that you have complete blockage on the left side and partial blockage in the right. And once they all become complete, then you got complete heart block. But so, so therefore, left bundle branch block in first degree is trifascicular. And this right bundle plus a left axis in first degree is trifascicular. Right bundle plus a right axis in first degree is trifascicular. So therefore, that's fascicular blocks. And it's important because they can lead to complete heart block. Okay, we're just going to look at some slides. Would you like the lights like they are? Is that alright with you all? It's okay, lights okay, or down some, or whatever you like. Again, we're looking at the Eindhoven Triangle. Eindhoven Triangle, top of the, here's the heart, right in here. Top, two sides. And then we make the graft of the Eindhoven Triangle. Make the graft of the Eindhoven Triangle. Okay. Again, that's the graft of the Eindhoven Triangle. That's how we can plot our axis out if we wanted to, but we don't want to. Again here, this says the normal axis from here to here, actually it's minus 30 to plus 10 of the Eindhoven Triangle. Okay, so let's, let's look at a few EKGs here. Okay, we said if it's negative in lead two, it's a left axis. If it's negative in lead one, it's a right axis. Okay, that's all we have to look at, two leads. Lead one, is it negative? No, it's positive. So it's not a right axis. 
lead to? Is it negative? No, it's positive. So that's not a left axis. That must be a normal axis. So when you plot it out and do all that work, it's a normal axis. Okay, let's look at leads again. Let's look at lead two. To be left axis has to be negative. It's not negative. Therefore, it's not a left axis. Let's look at lead one. It is negative. Therefore, it must be a right axis. You plot it out, it's a right axis deviation. Let's look at these again. Is it negative in lead one? No, so therefore it's not a right axis. Is it negative in lead two? Yes, it is. It must be a left axis. The left axis is very much left, you see? So the more negative it is, the more left it goes. See how simple that is? Who wants to plot them out anyway? <laughs> OK. Um, now let's look at this one. We see this, this guy has generous voltage here. In fact, V5 is one, two, three, four and a half big blocks, and V1 is about four and a half big blocks. Greater than seven big blocks, greater than 35 millimeters. So that's LVH. LVH, V5 and V1, that's all we're looking at, LVH. Again, we look at another EKG, and one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven. A lot of voltage, V5 and V1, or, or V6 and V1. But greater than 35, it's LVH. Another one, high voltage in V5 and V6, and very high voltage in the S of V1, it's LVH again. Now we look at this one. There's not a lot of high voltage in V5 and V6. But in V1, V1 should be negative. It's positive. It's positive. R is greater than... The R prime is greater than the S. RVH. Just look at one lead. RVH. You can look at this lead too and say it, but let's just look at V1. RVH. Okay, let's see. Do we have, do we have LVH? No, only two, little, two blocks. And no S here. Not LVH, but the, the R in V1 is awful positive. It's RVH. Another patient, same thing. It's not LVH, but the R is awful positive. RVH again. <coughs> okay. Um, now we look at a, a patient who has an RSR prime in V1. So that's sort of a, and a little bit widened. So that's right bundle branch. I'm sorry, that's a, um, a right bundle branch delay, but the major thing we have to look at here is that the P wave is greater than two and a half blocks. In fact, it's a little bit notched. So this is left atrial enlargement. There's other criteria. The P wave is negative in V1. It should be positive, but forget that criteria. The P wave is wider than two and a half blocks. It's left atrial enlargement. Okay. At this point in time, we look at this complex and we look at we see the the QRS is wide. It's wider than three small blocks. So we know we must have a bundle branch block. Which type is it? Where is it most positive? Where is the M wave? It's more positive in here. M wave is here, so it's right side, right bundle branch block. Again, we look at it, and uh, it's wide, greater than three small blocks, greater than 0.12 seconds. M complex in V1 is negative in V6, so it must be a right bundle branch block. This time we look, it's wide again, greater than three blocks, and no M complex, negative here, positive here, must be a left bundle branch block, over here, left. Okay, this patient comes in with ST segment elevations in a couple of leads. Not all over the place, some, some lowered, some higher, but it looks like two, 
three and F. Two, three, F. Well, an acute inferior injury, probably going to be an inf inferior influx. He's already got a Q wave here. So he's got the ST elevation plus the QS complex. Acute inferior infarct. Okay, this is another patient. This patient's got ST segment elevations, 2, 3, F, inferiorly. Acute inferior infarct again. Another patient with ST segment elevations, 2, 3, F, inferiorly. Inferior infarct. This patient also has an R wave in V1 and ST segment elevation in V1. So this might be an inferior infarct plus a true posterior infarct. You, you know, when you have a true posterior, you usually have an inferior with it. So you'd read that this is acute inferior infarct and probably with posterior extension. So probably a posterior and an inferior. It's the same vessel that gets them both. <coughs> okay, this gentleman comes in. His ST segment elevations are in V1, V2, V3, V4. One, two, three, four, anterior, an acute anterior infarct. This gentleman comes in, and it looks, looks like V5, 6, 4, 5, and 6 elevated. If that was the only leads elevated, it'd be anterior lateral. One's elevated. If that was the only lead elevated, it'd be true, a true lateral. This is elevated. These, are, Everything's elevated. Pericarditis, not an infarct. Everything's up. Pericarditis. Yeah, real peaked T waves. You could say maybe hyperacute infarct, but very, very peaked. So it's got to be that or probably hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia. And that's what that patient did have. <coughs> okay. Now again, we we look at the the QRS. We look at it in segments. We look at it in relation to what it means. The P wave is the atrial contraction. The QRS is the ventricular contraction, and the QT is ventricular repolarization. Again, we look at the PR, and that's atrial, and the QRS is ventricular. And you, and you notice your, your, your fiber, your, your bundles here, going to the Purkinje system. We're going to look at that again in a little bit. Here's your right bundle, and here's your left bundle, the anterior division and the posterior division. Those are your three bundles going to the Purkinje system. Okay, here we have a normal sinus rhythm. See that pretty often. And sinus tac is just the normal sinus rhythm that's faster than it should be, up to 150, sinus tac. You can see the P waves real good with sinus tac. When you start losing P waves, then it's not sinus tac. Okay. Now we have a normal P QRS, normal P QRS. All of a sudden, the P comes ahead of time. So therefore, this is just a premature atrial beat. P wave came ahead of time. P wave came ahead of time. Okay, again, we have a normal sinus rhythm, and the P wave is supposed to come here, but it looks like it comes ahead of time. So premature atrial contraction. Again, normal sinus rhythm. The P wave comes right here, it looks like, and we have this. So this is probably not a PVC, but it's probably a premature atrial contraction, but it came so close to this beat up here that the bundle, the right bundle, got tired. So we went into a barren C. So it's an aberrant PAC. PAC with aberrancy. Again, I can fool you for a PVC, so, but you can see a little P wave there. So premature atrial contraction, it got tired. Okay, here we go again. Again, we have premature atrial complexes. And again, we have a, a right bundle. The aberrancy is, is a right bundle branch block. Therefore, you get these M complexes many times, especially in V1. Look in V1. If you want to know about aberrancy, look in V1. Look for your M complex or your right bundle branch block. 
This is V1. Okay, great. So that's where you get your M. Hey, it's an M complex. It's upright. It's probably aberrant. Again, you have to differentiate that from the PVC. This is again V1, a little P wave here, an M complex in V1, probably aberrancy. Premature angular contraction with aberrant conduction. Again, PAC with aberrancy. Now, if you get a whole run of those aberrant beats, then it's, it's SVT with aberrancy. It's hard to differentiate that from VTAC many times. So if you're not sure, treat it like the worst thing. OK, here we go. Normal sonus rhythm. Normal, then the P wave comes, but it's inverted. So that's probably a junctional premature. Comes ahead of time, inverted, premature nodal contraction. <laughs> Again, an inverted P wave, like a premature nodal contraction. OK, and we have normal sonus rhythm. And it's slowing down. And when it slows down, you know, the, the SA node beats around 60 to 100. And the junctional area is like 40 to 60. And the Pachikinji system is like 20 to 40. So when it slows down too much from the SA node, then something comes in to take its place. And in this case, we have a junctional escape beat. It slowed down so much. But the SA node wasn't working, so the junctional rhythm came in. So we got no, PVs, no P's before, so it's a junctional beat. It looks like the previous one, so it's probably not a ventricular beat. Looks like the same one before, so it's superventricular, but no P makes it junctional. Junctional escape. Okay, then we get PVCs, and when the PVCs all look the same, it's unifascicular. There's our PVCs, unifascicular. Again, we have unifascicular PVCs. They look the same on the same lead. I have to look at the same lead, though, for that. All of a sudden, we have two of them that look different. So it's bifascicular, multiform, if you have three that look different on the same lead. OK, heart block, first of your heart block. What is first of your heart block? Nothing much. Just P long, PR prolongation, first degree heart block. It's greater than 0.2 seconds. Greater than one big block is first degree heart block. 0.2 seconds or greater. Okay, what, second degree heart block. Two types of second degree. Winky Bach or Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2, non Winky Bach. Okay, here's Winky Bach. PR prolongs, prolongs more, and then the P is without a QRS and drops until the SA node comes back working again. So that's Mobitz 1, Winkybach. A lot of times you see that with digitalis excess. Sometimes you see it in sort of normal people. It's not as pathologic as Mobitz 2. But again, here we go. The PR, it prolongs, prolongs again, and then drops. It's Mobitz 1. OK, now we have a situation where we have a, we have a drop beat again, several, two of them. But in this case, the PRs didn't prolong before the drop beat was produced. So when the PRs don't prolong before you drop beat, it's Mobitz 2. That's the worst type. That type is lower in the Purkinje, uh, nodal Purkinje system. It's lower. It's below the, below the AV node. That type is predisposed to producing complete heart block. Then, all of a sudden, our P waves are all random. So therefore, we have complete heart block here. The heart rate is in the 20s. So therefore, it's not a nodal mechanism, which would be 40 to 60. We have a complete heart block. And what had to take over was the, the ventricle itself, which only beats at 20 to 40. So that's our usual complete heart block. That means that the fascicles were totally blocked, not just partially. All three of them were totally blocked. <coughs> Again, you can see the P waves are marked, and the P waves are occurring randomly, and so we have complete heart block. Again, we have third degree heart block, and all we have is P waves across the screen. So this is very high grade third degree heart block, complete heart block again. 
Well, the problem here is that, that the node didn't come in to escape, and the ventricle didn't escape. It didn't, nothing escapes. All we had was P waves. Everything stopped. Again, it's asystole. It's a, high, a very high type of third degree hard block. Nothing's coming in to escape, no nodal escape, no ventricular escape, just asystole. Again, this is what we were talking about before. This is the right bundle, skinny. This is the left posterior bundle, fat, and the left anterior, medium. So whenever we have blocks in any of these, do we get fascicular blocks? All three is trifascicular, two of them bifascicular, one of them monofascicular. Again, we talk, like we discussed before, unifascicular block. The left anterior block, left axis, minus 30, a little, a little, a little Q in lead one. And that's what it looks like. What is, is this the left axis? Look at lead two. Is it positive or negative? Left axis. It's very negative, so it's very left axis. So that's left anterior fascicular block. His left posterior hemiblock, what's the criteria? Right axis, a little Q in lead three. Okay, let's figure out what kind of axis do we have. Do we have left axis? No, it's not negative in lead two. But look at lead one. It's negative in lead one. What does that make it? Right axis. That's all we have to look at, not to measure it out. That's boring. So right axis. So, right axis deviation and a Q wave in three. That's left posterior hemiblock. Okay, now we have a widened QRS. So we have a bundle branch block. What type, what type is it? It's more positive than one. So it's a right bundle branch block. But also, let's look over here. Let's look at our axis here. It's more negative than positive in one. So therefore, it's a right axis plus a right axis deviation. It makes it a bifascicular block. If we had PR prolongation, then it'd be trifascicular. Just that simple. So if you see a right bundle branch block, normal axis, Unifascicular. A deviation either way, bifascicular. With a PR prolongation, trifascicular. Okay, here's our tachycardias. We'll go over those in quickly. The supraventricular, the ventricular, the nodal. <coughs> okay. Um, Okay, here's, here's a normal sinus rhythm. Then all of a sudden we get a real fast beat. You don't see the P waves too well, so it's not a sinus tack. You don't see the P waves. It's a SVT, supraventricular, atrial tachycardia. This is pretty easy to tell because it's not widened. Now, if, it, if you had a barency, you'd see the same thing with widened. So how could you tell if it's ventricular or supraventricular with a barency? It'd be hard. Sometimes it's impossible to tell just by EKG criteria. Okay, here's another example of uh, sinus rhythm, and here's paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. Again, you don't see the P waves, and it's fast. Now, with atrial flutter, you get... For atrial flutter, you get these sawtooth waves, flutter waves. Usually, the flutter waves are at 300, are 300 per minute. If a patient's on digitalis or quinidine, it might be slower. But in general, it's 300 a minute. Well, from one block to one block is a rate of 300. If you have a QRS here and a QRS here, that'd be 300. That's how you can tell your rates. If you had a QRS here and a QRS here, it'd be going at 300. Two big blocks, it'd be going 150. Three big blocks, 100. Four big blocks, 75. Five big blocks, 
60. Six big blocks, 50. So you can eyeball your rate. You don't have an exact rate. But in general, when you have your flutter waves, it'll be one big block between them, a rate of about 300. Of course, if you had a QRS complex, which was one to one with your flutter, the man would be arresting. It's too fast, 300. So usually you have two to one block, three to one block, four to one block. In this case, we have a two to one block. So that every other beat is conducting. Sometimes you have a variable block. You see, the P waves are not quite 300, the flutter waves, but almost. He's probably on some kind of drug, but it's a variable block. Sometimes it's 2 to 1, sometimes it's 4 to 1, sometimes 3 to 1. Actually, this heart rate, this could be called PAT with block and not atrial flutter with block because the, the rate is fair amount below 300. But that's, they're all cousins anyway. Again, here we have the sawtooth pattern, about 300, a little bit less than 300, 270 or so per minute. That's flutter. Now we've got a four to one, it looks like, a well, four to one flutter. So you can tell that easier than a two to one flutter because you can see your sawtooth pattern better. Okay, with atrial fibrillation, what do you have? You have irregular irregularity. Everything is irregular. You can't, you can't find any kind of pattern. And you have these little waves here, they're not P waves, they're not flutter waves, they're just sort of fibrillatory waves. Sometimes they can be confused with P waves sometimes, but they're fibrillatory waves. And also with atrial fibrillation, you're pr sometimes when it's beating fast, so the beats come close to the previous beat, the heart is prone to aberrancy. That right bundle gets tired after a while. And so sometimes you get a right bundle branch block pattern in V1, aberrant beats come in there. So when you start having right bundle branch block patterns in V1, with atrial fib, you, aberrancy is a high probability. Doesn't rule out PVCs for sure, but it, think aberrancy also. Here's atrial fibr fibrillation with a controlled response, irregular irregularity. Again, here's atrial fibrillation, and all of a sudden, in, in V3R, which is like V1 sort of, you got this rapid, rapid rate, a little bit irregular, so what happened here is probably aberrancy. Aberrancies took off. So we have atrial fibrillation with aberrant conduction, which simulates VTAC. And sometimes you can't tell for sure. Treat it like the worst one. Atrial fibrillation, irregular irregularity, slow response, too much dig on board maybe. Rapid response, needs more dig. One's too much, one's not enough. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you see, you know, if you had aberrancy and you were looking at V6, you know, you're positive in V1 with aberrancy usually, and you're negative in V6. But hey, we're positive in V6. This is VTAC probably. So here's paroxysmal VTAC. That's probably not aberrancy. Ends, we have a couplet there. Hmm. Then a triplet here, short VTAC, couplets, short VTAC, triplet, just plain VTAC, wide, bizarre looking, dangerous looking. Again, and more examples of ventricular tachycardia with beats that fall on top of each other, fusion beats. Here we have normal sinus rhythm, and then a PVC probably falls on top of that T wave. Falls on the vulnerable period of the T wave, and therefore it gives us ventricular tachycardia. So you have to watch those PVCs fall on top of that T wave. It produces VTAC sometimes in a sick heart. Torsade, that's interesting, VTAC. Pure wetting. The movement of ballerina around the point. And so with, with torsade, the VTAC is strange. This is the point, but it's sort of going around this point, you know, up and down and up 
and down and up and down to our side. That usually, that usually means quinidine toxicity. It's a bad VTAC. Saw a lot with flecainide. It's a flecainide type of VTAC. To our side, quinidine. Quinidine syncope means VTAC producing death from quinidine, which was torside. Torside is a bad type of VTAC. Now sometimes we see just an accelerated ventricular rhythm, which is sort of a slow VTAC. Not quite as dangerous as torside and the fast VTACs, but not desirable either. And then we can go from a normal sinus rhythm into V-fib. Now, that happened a lot with flecainide. Gosh, the patients would be, have flecainide killed PVCs, stop PVCs, and you watch the monitor, there'd be no PVCs, just V-fib. And sometimes it's hard to convert from this type of V-fib that's spontaneous from a drug. This is coarse ventricular fibrillation. You've all seen that. I know that many times. Fine v ventricular fibrillation, so it should be shocked if you're not sure if you have V-fib or whether it's a straight line, just shock it anyway. Again, the RNT, we saw how dangerous it was before when the PVC falls on top of the T. These PVCs are falling pretty close to the T, pretty close to the T, pretty close to the T, and all of a sudden we get V-fib, coarse V-fib. Again, we have an episode of ventricular flutter, or ventricular tachycardia coming into regular V-fib. So basically, that's how to read an EKG. We went into arrhythmias at the end part of this, but the first part of this lecture was how to read the 12 lead EKG. And just with those simple those simple rules, anybody can read a 12 lead EKG easier than putting up one of these boards. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you.